Oh, Paul's got the, he's got the doorbell tonight. Okay, uh, good evening. This is the Wednesday, February 5th, 2020, regular town council meeting for the town of Scarborough. Item number one is me calling this to order. So there it is. Uh, item number two is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item number three, <clears throat> excuse me, item number three is roll call. Councilor Cudio? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Councilor Gleisting? Here. Councilor Katarina? Here. Councilor Johnson? Here. Councilor Hamill? Here. Chairman Johnson? Here. Uh, item number four is order number 20015, an act on the request for an executive session pursuant to Title I MRSA 4056A regarding a personnel matter relating to the town manager's evaluation. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Great. We will adjourn and we will be back promptly at 7 p.m. Sort of.
doesn't Tony? She won last don't, week. Yeah, don't you always? Good evening, everybody. Uh, the this council meeting actually began at 6 p.m., so we are going to jump right into item number four. Um, item number four is general public comments for anything that is not on the agenda. Is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak to anything that's not on the agenda? Item number five is approval of the January 8, 2020 regular town council meeting minutes. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion? I'd just like to commend Tody for a great job pulling together minutes Thank from you. last meeting. It was no easy task. <laughs> <laughs> we had a lot of amendments. That's true. Yes. Any more? All those in favor? Great. Item number seven is items to be signed the treasurer's warrants. I will do that um, after the meeting. Uh, item number eight is non-action item. Uh, we have one non-action item tonight. It's an update from Project Grace on the fuel fund. Good evening, councilors Thank and uh, manager Tom, staff, guests. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to address you briefly tonight. My name is Steffi Cox. I'm the Executive Director of Project Grace. And um, on behalf of our Board of Directors, I wanted to give you an update on the fuel fund. Uh, with a messy winter storm coming up, um, we know that no matter what Punxsutawney Phil says, it's going to be a while before we see a warm spring. Um, so the other thing we can say with certainty is that Scarborough knows how to come together for common cause. We know how to extend a helping hand and we show up when it really counts. Our town's eighth annual Keeping Our Neighbors Warm Fuel Rally is this coming Saturday at the Oak Hill Firehouse. And this is just one of those occasions when we all show up. Uh, the fire, police, community services, and the library all pitch in to help Project Grace host this event. The clerk's office gives out clink bags, and the Lions, Kiwanis, Rotary, and other groups doing good all year round are with us on Saturday morning as well. From 10 to noon, there are activities, bake sale, raffle, um, safety demos, a number of things like that, and an uplifting performance by the State Street Jazz Band as well. And uh, we hope everybody will come out. Uh, for those who may be hearing about Project Grace for the first time, we're a neighbor helping neighbor group here in town. We've been helping with all sorts of needs for about 20 years now. And our partnership with the town on many initiatives includes uh, the hugely successful um, community Thanksgiving dinner, the school lunches and school backpacks and summer camp stipends to name just a few of the ways we work together to help our neighbors. In a typical winter, Project Grace helps with fuel assistance for about 65 households here in town. And even with generous discounts from friends like Conroy's, um, we can easily see our fuel bill climb up to about $20,000 a year, even more than that sometimes. Uh, local philanthropist Eddie Wooden has helped establish the fuel fund in 2008. And over the years together, we've raised $150,000 for fuel assistance for our neighbors. That is an impressive amount of money when you think about the donations come in clink bags, they come in five or ten dollar raffle amounts, uh, modest checks from people in all neighborhoods, and uh, grants as well from uh, small family foundations. Um, about half of that $150,000 comes in during the rallies. And so Saturday is an incredibly important uh, day for us and for your neighbors, and we hope you'll help us get the word out about that. And uh, I'd like to remind everybody that uh, it really doesn't matter how low the temperatures go or what the price of oil or a quart of firewood is. We have a lot of neighbors who struggle every week, every month to pay their bills, to put food on the table, to pay for medicines, the rent, and few of them have, um, have all that they need to, to pay their bills and take care of their families. Um, not too long ago, a senior told me that uh, he said, honey, I cheated the thermostat. I put it up to 58. 
58. That's cold. Um, so we have folks from all walks of life. We put up a map of town and put pins in it on all the neighborhoods for who's giving and who's receiving. Every neighborhood has givers and receivers. And sometimes those receiving also give back and any one of us can find ourselves in a hard spot. So um, the fuel fund is incredibly important to the well-being of our neighbors. It is thanks to the partnership of the police, the fire, the library, and all of you that we can respond when the calls come in. And believe me, it is a difficult call to make to ask for help. And um, we're grateful to uh, be able to, to thank the town for its support for the fuel fund. And if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. No? OK. Great. We'll Thank see you, you Saturday. Much. Thanks very much. OK, order number 20007, a 7 PM public hearing on the authorization of a credit enhancement agreement for WEX and the authorization of a delegation to the town manager to execute such agreement in, substan in substantially the form as presented to the town council. Uh, before we hold the public hearing, uh, two things are going to happen. I'll give a quick uh, update of the timeline on how we got here. And then we're going to have town attorney uh, Shauna Cook Mueller is going to come up and give us a quick presentation about the agreement itself. The town councilors are going to ask her some clarifying questions if we see it necessary. And then we'll begin uh, public comment. So with that, I will roll right into this timeline. You'll have to excuse me. I can't, I, I can't, almost can't see that far. So if I'm squinting, I apologize. Uh, July of last year, uh, WEX sent out a request for a proposal uh, for the local area. Uh, many developers answered that request. Uh, part of um, Ben Devine's LLC's request uh, included a letter from the town. Uh, and the letter of the town addressed about, I, there was somewhere along the lines of 20 criteria of, of what makes Scarborough um, impressive. Uh, in that request of proposal, they did ask specifically to see if there was an opportunity for tax breaks. That was in the original uh, request for proposal. Uh, September of last year, WEX seeks more information and um, clarification from all applicants. So at this point, I believe the pool was somewhere around a dozen towns that were in the running. Uh, September 6, WEX representatives and consultant meets with Peter Hayes, Katie Foley, Tom Hall, and Karen Martin. Uh, that was last, uh, last year's council chair and last year's council vice chair. On uh, November 18th, WEX, yep, I am reading that correctly. November 18th, WEX requests a meeting with Tom Hall and Karen Martin, and the sites are then narrowed down to the Downs and South Portland. Uh, November 19th, Tom Hall meets with WEX representatives in, at uh, headquarters in Portland. Uh, December 4th, council executive session to consider no negotiating a CEA directly with WEX. Uh, I'll take a quick second and deviate from the timeline to give somebody, people a background of the December 4th meeting. The purpose of the December 4th executive session uh, from me, the chair, was essentially to see if there was a temperature, yes or no, if we were willing to entertain a um, credit enhancement agreement. Uh, on December 18th, there was a council executive session to consider the CEA with WEX. So coming out of the fourth, two weeks prior, there was at least enough temperature for us to discuss if the council was willing to consider a CEA agreement. Coming out of the December uh, 18th meeting, uh, we did offer WEX our initial deal, which included a 0% CEA on the current project and a um, incentive for expansion of future projects. Uh, WEX does currently have a letter of intent to expand beyond what we're actually talking about. Um, and our first offer to WEX was no CEA on the current building, additional uh, a CEA of some sort on expansions if they were to happen. That offer was soundly rejected by WEX. Uh, on December 20th, Council Chairman, myself, Vice Chair Don Hamill, Town Manager in um, Center Street Partnerships, which include Ben Devine and Rocky Rispera. We met uh, up at WEX headquarters. Uh, at that meeting, there was a comparison between us and South Portland. The package that we had offered um, that was rejected was not considered. South Portland's package was roughly $320,000 more incentive than what Scarborough was offering. Um, as a result of that meeting, Council Chairman myself, Don Hamill, brought back to the Council to decide 
if we were and willing to entertain approximately meeting them halfway um, so that is where the hundred and fifty thousand dollar number is coming from per year that was um, somebody can correct me if they disagree but the rationale was meeting halfway between Scarborough's incentive package and South Portland's incentive package on January 8th, uh, Council Executive Session to further consider WEX CA guidance provided to the manager on a proposal to WEX pending public review and Council approval. That's the exact date that this, that this agreement we're talking about today that is published in the agenda packet. That's where this was formed. Um, and then on the 17th, we drafted the CEA. We have already had on the 22nd, we had a public workshop in the first reading. Uh, that brings us to today, which is February 5th. We have a public hearing. And February 19th is expected to be a second reading. Uh, there is one more date that I would like to state. Um, February 13th at 6 p.m. in council chambers is a community roundtable about this specific deal and WEX coming to town. Uh, it does not have a set agenda. It will not be structured. It's in the sense of come and talk to some elected officials and some staff to learn more about this deal. Um, so that brings us to where we are now. That is the timeline. Uh, I can confidently say there's not a whole lot that you don't know in the audience at this point that we know as counselors as far as the deal and the, chronolog the chronolog chronology. chronology of the deal. Thank you. Uh, with that, Shauna, you want to take it away? Okay, thank you very much. Um, Good evening, Council. My name is Shauna Cook Mueller, for the record. I'm an attorney at Bernstein Shure, and I represent the town of Scarborough on tax increment financing matters. And I just want to begin by uh, making sure everybody remembers and recalls that a year ago, approximately, the town of Scarborough designated the Scarborough Downtown Omnibus TIF District, which is a TIF district of over 900 acres that encompasses both the Scarborough Downs property um, as well as other property in the community um, in the center of town. Um, the way that this TIF district was structured is that 3% uh, of the incremental taxes during the term of this district are set aside for municipal economic development projects that were outlined in the development program that the council adopted last year. And then in addition to that, the council already previously authorized the execution of a credit enhancement agreement with Crossroads Holdings LLC, Scarborough Downs um, developer, that addresses um, an additional incremental tax um, agreement on just the Scarborough Downs property. So, um, and, and for those of you, I can get into the details of that um, on another date, but um, for the, the first 10 years of that agreement, um, Scarborough Downs or the, the Crossroads Holdings LLC is um, entitled to a 40% um, of incremental tax revenues on that property payment from the, from the town. Um, at 10 years, there is a potential for that percentage to go down, and it may stay at 40%, depending on certain performance metrics. And then, again, there's a check-in on performance metrics at year 20. Um, so that's just the setting of the stage. Now, here we are. We're, um, tonight's discussion is about a proposed CEA credit enhancement agreement with WEX. Um, at the time the district was approved, the town was authorized to enter into future credit enhancement agreements following a public hearing. That's the, tonight's public hearing. Um, and the way that this TIF district is structured, it only covers the 17 acres that is the planned site for the WEX um, building. And to the extent after 3%, which is set aside for municipal TIF projects, and after 40% or whatever future lesser percentage may apply under the Crossroads Holding CEA, then an additional amount will be captured in incremental taxes and a payment to WEX will be made of $150,000 per year for 15 years. This will start following the tax year in which a certificate of occupancy is issued for the WEX project. Um, and that is the summary of the proposal. I'm very happy to take any questions or, or elaborate. Thank you. Anybody have any clarifying questions on the council? Councilor Clucci. So, so let's say the building's appraised at 25 million and there isn't enough, enough tax revenue 
to do the 3%, the 40%, and the $150,000. Do we still owe them the $150,000? No. Um, the contract is drafted so that um, the 3% thir needs to be set aside for the municipal project cost account, and then the 40% or whatever applies under the Crossroads Holding CEA. And then to the extent there is available incremental taxes in addition to that, they would receive that in a payment if it's less than 150000 If it is more than 150000 150000 is the payment amount for each year for the 15-year term. Thank you. Thanks. Any more? Councillor Hayes? Yeah, just, just a quick question. Um, as this as this has sort of unfolded, there's been already some public conversations with the other parties that are involved, and some verbal representations have been made around. You know, part of it we met halfway. The 150 thousand, the developers were going to meet us the other halfway. The other 150. If representations have been made verbally, do we? Is there an accountability, a due diligence, a fiduciary responsibility that? It's up to the council to make sure some of those things are documented. Um, if 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 those representations are made and they're not followed through, does that create some liability for the town um, on the behalf of the taxpayers that we made decisions based on representations, but we have no documentation to support it? Um, so I think you're talking about representations that were made about the private deal between the developer the, and wax that and there was representations made about covering traffic impact all the traffic impact that would be caused by the development um I, you know i think to the extent that the council wants to ask for um some additional information and confirmations the council is free to do that um the way the credit enhancement agreement is drafted there are particular obligations that I have described and we, we are protecting ourselves to ensure we don't obligate us to, to pay something that we don't have um, but there isn't any obligation in the credit enhancement agreement to ask for confirmations about the private deal no but I guess my my bigger question was do we have any accountability responsibility to taxpayers that we have made verbal representations to things if those aren't if we haven't done due diligence to make sure that those are in fact in place, is there any recourse for taxpayers to say that somehow we didn't do what we were supposed to do to, for our fiduciary responsibility? I don't believe there is a legal obligation there. You know, what you may be talking about is, you know, voters' ability to decide that it wasn't the right choice in retrospect or it was the right choice, and then they have the ability, of course, when they go to the polls. but. Um, but the council has delegated the authority or is, is vested with the authority to decide whether this particular credit enhancement agreement is the right deal for the town based on the information you have and you've asked for at that time. And so uh, I think that's where I would come out on that. Thank you. Councilor Gleisting. Um, so just a quick follow-up on that. So I think you're saying we have the right to see the information, but we don't have to see the information. Um, but we have the right to see it, but there's not going to be a legal legal problem if we don't see the representations that have been made, like the developer saying they're splitting the difference with us and things like that. Um, yeah, so, so I mean, the council has the, um, and the town ha in this negotiation has had the ability to ask for whatever you would need in order to feel comfortable that okay. this is the deal. So that's sort of what I was, what I was intending to say. Okay, that, yeah, great. So... I, um, so my question, I might have a follow-up on it, depending on your answer, was, so the way I understand this, and I think you've described it well, um, so the, the, um, the underlying deal, which is kind of pinned on this, there's a, the, uh, let's call it the office complex, is going to generate a certain value, mm -hmm. and then it's going to generate a certain tax bill. Mm -hmm. And the downs is going to get 40% uh, back based on their underlying deal. Um, and so uh, my understanding is that that amount that they get back will not be discounted by the WEX 150K. 
Um, so I guess my question was, when in their deal, I think it's pretty clear that if the town doesn't receive taxes, so let's say if Maine Health put a building in there and they're exempt by state law, like the Downs doesn't get 40% of, you know, a reduced tax property, you know, the, I mean, of a no tax property. So th th there were, since we're, we're not going to have access to that 150 k if this deal goes through, we're going to give it to WEX. Um, what would it take to say that we're going to reduce, you know, the amount that, that the underlying agreement gets by the 150 k I mean, is that, that you'd have to change the underlying agreement or, or how would that work? Yeah, so, so I think you understand correctly how the two agreements work together, which is there is already a current obligation to make that 40% payment. And then um, if there is additional increment available, which we project, project that there certainly will be, another $150,000 per year will be owed. Um, to the extent the town wanted to try to um, you know, sort of take that 150,000 out of the 40%, we would have had to renegotiate an existing contract, um, you know, that that the town has already entered into. Um, so, and that has not been done. Any more? <clears throat> Shauna, thank you very much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. I, I did have one more. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, so on the TIF, the three percent. Um, that the document for the state, it spelled out pretty clearly what we could spend the 3% on, and basically it's roads and economic development uh, planning and the uh, SEDCO and some things like that. Um, if, is it ever, does anyone ever pay the an additional CEAs out of that money? Is that ever done? Or, I mean, clearly it would take an amendment to the state to say that we wanted to do that, to, to pay the CEA out of that 3%, but is that ever done or is that just something that's that's never done? Well, certainly uh, TIF districts are amended all the time. Um, so it's certainly possible for the town at some point to say, you know, we don't want to use this 3% the way we originally thought we, we would, and you go back in and you do an amendment and then you have that amendment approved through the state. What we're doing tonight is part of a process um, related to um, the omnibus status of the district, which provided that the town council has the authority to enter into credit enhancement agreements and effectively increase that capture percentage without having to do a full amendment process through DECD. But you certainly could in the future. Okay. And, and, it, and there is something that will have to be submitted to the state, right, by WEX to say how many employees they expect to expand by because they're moving from one town to another. So it was like a, a clause G or something. I mean, we have the right to do it, but there's something we have to tell the state that we're, we're giving this CEA to WEX. Is that right? Yes. We are required to submit the, any executed credit enhancement agreements to the state along with um, what is a form of DECD that's called a jobs goals form. Um, and just some identification information about the developer or the, the company that's receiving the credit enhancement agreement. Great. So we'll Thank do that. We don't expect any response from DECD, right. but they put yeah. that in their records. Because the agreement's already approved. Correct. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Any more? Okay. Thank you. All right. With that, um, we're not. No, not for the lawyer. No. But with that, we, we are opening up public comment. So uh, if you guys would like to line up and <coughs> anybody like to speak to, this is the public hearing on the WEC CEA right now. So we are, if you're here to speak to this, then now's the chance. Good evening. My name's Art Dillon, 180 Black Point Road. Um, my feelings, as well as those that I'm about to read, if I can back up here, um, I'm representing the Scarborough Community Chamber of Commerce as their past president. Um, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity. <clears throat> in our recent board meeting in late January, our board of directors um, have voted in favor of supporting this CEA in favor of the WEX development. With this proposal, there's no initial cost to the town. For a proposed $45 million taxable piece of property, the return on investment of $150,000 CEA for 15 years just makes sense. 
uh, to have a Fortune, uh, international Fortune 1000 company founded here in Maine would be in any community's, uh, a, a feather in any community's cap. But more than that, WEX has multiple communities or had multiple communities vying for this position or for this development. And they've chosen Scarborough and the Downs as their ideal location. They want to invest in this particular project and they have future expansion on, in their mind as well. Uh, but they also want to in invest in our communities. This would also help balance the tax base, um, which we've heard a lot about. This will also bring additional development in the surrounding areas inside and outside the Downs property, potentially shifting from residential to commercial development. The WEX development will also initiate further pursuit of alternate transportation options, such as buses, trains, and carpools in and through Scarborough sooner rather than later. This will benefit many commuters, commuters ju not just in Scarborough. The town, town council, the Scarborough Economic Development Corporation have done an exceptional job vetting and negotiating this proposal. This is a win-win and we should not be, and it should not be missed. This isn't just for the good of WEX. This is the good for our town. On behalf of our membership board and business community at large, we hope the town council will consider this to agree to agreeing to this proposal so that we can seize this extraordinary opportunity. I thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. My name is John Krasnick. Uh, my address is 12 Evergreen Farms Road. Uh, I'm speaking tonight on behalf of the board of the Scarborough Economic Development Corporation, which I currently serve as vice chair. Uh, SEDCO's mission is to develop, support, and promote actions that lead to a healthy, diverse, and resilient local economy. And with that in mind, um, the SEDCO board welcomes the decision by WEX to locate a 200,000 square foot building, as well as up to 1,200 employees in Scarborough. Um, SEDCO has submitted a letter to the council uh, in support of the project, as well as the proposed credit enhancement agreement but I just wanted to touch on a few of the points outlined in the letter. Uh, the WEX project um, is proposed within a designated growth area as defined by the 2006 comprehensive plan as well as the draft comprehensive plan update. Uh, and the area is zoned for projects of this scale. The building will be within walking distance of both new and planned residential developments providing opportunities for employees to both live and work in Scarborough. The project will create demand for existing businesses throughout Oak Hill, as well as future demand for office, retail, and services in the new Main Street area of the Downs, as well as on Hagas Parkway. A 200,000 square foot building with a potential value of up to say $45 million is a, is a rare level of investment in Maine today. WEX also provides an impressive set of employee benefits, invests heavily in their host communities, will provide a reason for young graduates to stay in Maine and specifically Scarborough, and will continue to invest in Scarborough as they grow, having retained <laughs> options on two additional parcels within the Downs. In addition, the proposed project fulfills the vision outlined in the comprehensive plans creates a strong revenue stream from the estimated property taxes, will attract additional investments to the area, and improves the ratio of non-residential to residential development for property tax revenue. So in closing, uh, from an economic development viewpoint, the SEDCO board is very supportive of the project and the credit enhancement agreement. We believe that this is a very exciting opportunity for the town to partner with a very important and growing company in the state that has chosen Scarborough to be part of its home. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, uh, Leanne Casalonis, 11 Orchard Street, and I'm here in favor of WEX. Um, you've heard a couple times already that we are a Fortune 500 company. 
um, growing year over year. Huge news given the news today about other companies starting to reduce their staff. Um, and out of full disclosure, I'm a long-term uh, WEX employee, so I can speak with a little confidence on what we do do. Um, in 2019, WEX contributed over a million dollars in philanthropic dollars to the communities. 90% of those dollars stayed here in Southern Maine, benefiting 150 nonprofit organizations. They touched us. They touched us a lot. Um, our employees, we logged 4,300 volunteer hours out of the volunteer time granted. The company gives us 16 hours, and 4,300 hours were logged by employees. Um, I can say that that didn't include all of my time here in Scarborough. <laughs> um, but we have a long understanding of what it takes to be part of a community. We're responsive to the community, and we give back to where we're located. With a particular focus on STEM, WEX supports educational initiatives and organizations that will help Maine build a strong pipeline of talent. Through nonprofit, nonprofit partners, um, we offer STEM space programming such as Codex, bringing middle schoolers into WEX to learn the basics of coding. We're doing that with partnership with the Boys and Girls Club of Southern Maine. Again, Scarborough students get to take part of this. They're learning how to code at an early age, inspiring them to go on to further education. We support statewide organizations such as Junior Achievement and Educate Maine, again, working directly with local schools to offer quality programs for all Maine students, again, including Scarborough students. What is WEX going to bring to Scarborough? Even after the CEA, they will be the sixth largest taxpayer in town. They will be a lead tenant, enticing other businesses to launch into bounds and on Hagas Parkway with an estimated valuation of over $160 million. Again, a benefit to Scarborough. It's a growing company. They have their eye on future expansion, as we've heard. That's going to generate even more tax revenue for the town, and specifically to our schools. The $227,000 in tax payment represents three full-time teaching positions, six full-time educational techni technicians, and 17% of our athletic budget. This is the first step in reducing the homeowner's burden of shouldering 77% of revenue generated in Scarborough, especially as we know on the horizon we have major initiatives coming to town. This is the right move for Scarborough. It is going to rebalance us, and it's a win for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kevin Freeman. I live on uh, Sterlingwood Drive in Scarborough. Sterlingwood Drive, that's right <clears throat> west of the intersection of Holmes Road and Broad Turn. It's a big commuter road. I watch everyone from Buxton and Standish come by my house every morning. Hopefully they stop in Scarborough. And hopefully if we get WEX, they will definitely stop in Scarborough. Um, <clears throat> I've worked in the construction industry for 30 years. I am a board member of SEDCO. Uh, I was on the losing proposal for WEX when it was known as Wright Express. <laughs> and if anyone works in the construction industry, they get a gas card from Wright Express. But I was on the losing end of a proposal in 1999 that led to the headquarters going to South Portland. Uh, I was working for Alliance Construction on Pleasant Hill Road. It was proposed to go on Payne Road, kind of like right behind where Extended Stay America is. And it ended up being built at 225 Gorham Road. And we started on the SEDCO board hearing about the, the new WEX headquarters and the RFP back in around 2015, 2016, the one that ended up going to Portland and is now open. In my career in 2010, I looked at the data center on Darling Avenue for WEX. They were looking to do some renovations. And at the time, I, our design partner, the ID group out of Boston, said, yeah, we'll look at this. He said, because we know there's going to be a bigger one down the road. And I got a feeling that there might be something in that 200,000 square foot office building that's being proposed for the Downs. Um, I also wanted to make note of, as uh, things were said about what WEX has done in the community, I, I had the uh, 
the uh, good fortune to serve on a committee with Mike Dubiak at USM when Mike Dubiak was the chairman of WEX. And uh, talk about giving back to the community, he gave a million dollar grant that started the Digital Science and, U and Innovation Lab at USM, uh, which is now up and running. And it's, and it's kind of an outgrowth of the Educate Maine program, which was another big give back to build the workforce of the future. And it's my opinion that the workforce of the future is what's being eyed for this project. So I, I, uh, I, I mention all that, that background information because I, I think it's just important as you, as you make your decisions to support this project or not. Uh, I hope you do support it and I really ask you um, to give it your all to support it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Good evening, April Scyther, 14 Huntley Drive. I am also here to speak in favor of um, the WEX CEA. Uh, admittedly, it took me longer to arrive at my position on this um, than my husband who spoke in favor last week. Uh, he has been really um, helping me to kind of find my way through all the noise in this over the past week or so. Um, and there are a number of compelling arguments um, being made on both sides of this issue. At the end of the day, there are always going to be hypothetical scenarios that can influence our decisions. Perhaps we can walk away on the deal and WEX will still come. Perhaps without WEX, the Downs developers will apply for more residential units. Perhaps WEX will spur commercial growth for our town. Perhaps WEX will bring traffic to a complete standstill. All of these potential pros and cons have their merit, but they are also hypotheticals. I'm asking town council to make their decision not based on a laundry list of hypotheticals, which, as human nature dictate, we tend to pick and choose the hypotheticals that fit our predetermined answer. So if you know you're a no, it's easy to latch on to those hypothetical situations that fit your own internal narrative. And so what I'm asking town council to do is drown out the noise and to look at the deal in front of you because without weighing all of the hypotheticals based on their merit, there's no other way to selectively pick and choose which of these hypotheticals you are or are not going to put weight in. At the bottom, at the, the bottom line is that it's being reported that this deal will bring in an average of $200,000 after cost to serve for the next 15 years. That's teacher salaries, that's first responders, that's maybe even a little bit of extra change in the taxpayers' pockets. So I am asking for the town council to please consider the WEX CEA, and I look forward to arguing with you for the next several years about how we spend that money. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. <clears throat> Carol Gotro, uh, 27 Jamco Mill Road uh, in Scarborough. Um, I too have been wrestling with the, with the uh, yay or nay on the program. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, relative to um, the $40,000, I'm sorry, 40% 40 return to the developer on this particular property, if we add that to the um, $150,000 per year, what is that total number per year? It will vary uh, over time. Average? Well, first year? What, where I'm going with this, where I'm going with it is, is um, <clears throat> the 40% has to stay very visible. And for us to make a decision, that 40% um, that's going back to the developer added to the um, $150,000 annually is a significant amount of money. And I would, I'm asking the, the TC to uh, look at the bottom line in terms of generating revenue. How many dollars will end up 
coming back to the taxpayer. If that goes negative, I would have to say no. Um, and so to that, I would like to see a number, a total number of the $150,000 plus the 40% going back to the developer. Um, the, uh, and as time passes, um, or let's say WEX doesn't take the property, does the deal on that property go away for anybody else coming in and we start fresh? Um, and uh, as uh, that significant number that I was talking about, the 40% plus the 150, as years go on, there's more money going back to the developer. Now, I don't want the word developer to sound like a, a nasty number or name. <coughs> But if we are to cut the best deal for the taxpayer, we have to take a look at the number of dollars of that total package, the 40% and the $150,000, and we should make room for negotiations with the developer, because that is going to be a very large number. And that's a direct loss to myself and every taxpayer in, in the room here. So for us to do diligence on this project, we need to look at the total cost, and I would like to see the number that falls out after all expenses on an annual basis on this program in the downs. It's approximately $200,000, but I will, a year after all costs to serve and after everything you just cited. Um, but I'll have, I think Karen is teeing something up for you as well. So yeah, I'll, yeah. and I'll, I'll email you any, I'll email a spreadsheet for you too. Absolutely. Okay. So, yeah. so I mean, that's, that, that's close. Yep. And the bottom line is uh, it needs to be treated so that the, the, the taxpayer ends up with a plus at the bottom of the line for sure. Okay. And also as new developments or opportunities come into town, and I'm running over my three minutes, I guess. Um, I think everybody should treat, be treated on the same fair <coughs> process and formula. I think there should be a qualification for any company, whether it's a WEX or a guy bringing in a fill-in station. Everybody should be treated the same because before too long, our, uh, there are going to be businesses coming in and say, hey, how about me? So-and-so got such and such. Okay. I think we have to make that scenario go away. For us to do our job going forward as a town, and we're going to be here for the next 100 or so years, I hope we put a process, step-by-step -step process for qualifying a potential, okay, and a formula that will show the bottom line that the taxpayer can look at and say, okay, we should get a benefit here. Maybe our taxes aren't going to go up 3% this year. Maybe they're going to go up a percent and a half. So. That's my message, and at this point, I can't say yeah and nay because I'm not too sure how this is all going to shake out until we, as a town, have a process for qualifying people. Thank you. Are there any others? Good evening, Dennis Meehan, 28 Jamco Mill Road, speaking up to my neighbor. Um, I'm also the current volunteer president of the Scarborough Chamber of Commerce. I just wanted to come tonight and thank you, the council, um, and the reason being for your diligence on this process and recognizing what a special opportunity a company like WEX is. We've heard the accolades of a growing company from Maine and what they bring and the opportunity to put them as kind of the staple tenant in, an op in a project like this is going to spur lots of other development. Lots of other development that if WEX doesn't take this property, might be split up into one, two, three, four, or five other tenants to get to where we are with one big company. I want the four or five other companies to come too, but I want them to come around the anchor tenant that we have. And the proposal that you put together, you know, and going forward with one proposal, and then meeting with them and hearing what other people are offering, and then coming to a spot in the middle that protects the citizens, protects the taxpayers, but also recognizes the opportunity to get a company that is growing internationally and wants to continue to grow and they want to do it here is, is an amazing thing. And I know it's hard to come to when you've got people talking about all different sorts of tax pressures on one side and screaming corporate welfare on another, but also knowing that your opportunity as a town, this is the tool that you have to attract businesses to come in certain ways. You don't have the opportunities to do other things. CEAs are how 
towns, companies, and states all over the country attract businesses to them. And I know you put a lot of work into this, and um, obviously I'm here to endorse the project and hope that you will as well. Um, I just want to thank you for your time on that and for the due diligence you put into this project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sam Marciso, 16 Ruby May Lane. Um, I'm going to just state out some facts. First, I got a question. Th after the 15 years, does the CEA go away? It does. Good point there. Uh, that increases the uh, tax revenue quite a bit, and 15 years can go like that. Uh, Wex is a powerful main brand, and it is an honor they chose Scarborough for the place for their continued growth. It's a global company, Fortune 500 company, is one of the fastest growing in the country and we'll bring up to 1,200 jobs to town. That's a great thing. WEX will be a catalyst for growth for small businesses in the area. I am contemplating and working on bringing my companies to the Downs development. Having, when I heard the news they were coming, it just excited me more to make that happen. Um, a big thing and a big part that really is important is WEX will help fix the mix of the 77% residential and 23% commercial tax base. Uh, which requires most of the services is the residential tax base. These guys don't require as much. That's a win. Other towns have incentives for business. Uh, Scarborough uh, doesn't. This is a way for the town to be reasonably competitive. The WEX deal is, a, is contingent on an incentive from the town. I support the WEX CEA. I ask you, please, take advantage of this wonderful opportunity we have in front of us. Thank you. Any more? Uh, good evening. My name is Rick Cheney. I live, I live at 9 Hampton Circle here in town. Um, I come at this um, with a bit of um, historical perspective. I've lived in Scarborough for more than 26 years. Uh, I've had the pleasure of serving on a number of bodies, including the planning board, uh, the 2006 comprehensive plan, uh, committee which I co-chaired with Sylvia Most. I'm currently serving on the Long Range Planning Committee and we're working on the new comprehensive plan or the update of the comprehensive plan. I served on the Growth and Services Committee uh, years ago with Bill Andreessen and we uh, worked hard to come up with uh, numbers that supported uh, how the town should grow. Um, all those are committees, thank God, I don't have to get votes to get on, but uh, they've, it's been, it's been a, a, a pleasure to serve on them. One of the underlying themes in the Growth and Services Committee was the importance of commercial development for town versus residential. Residential brings children. It brings pressure on our school system. Um, it's good to have a mix. But we, in the Growth and Services Report, pointed to the importance of raising the ratio of commercial development to residential development. Now we have an opportunity to bring in a world-class company. The state of Maine is fortunate that WEX is here. And Scarborough is fortunate that WEX wants to come here. I think the issue before you is pretty straightforward. We're talking about a, a, a modest investment by the town. And really, it's not really an investment because it only gets paid if the taxes are generated, as Attorney Cook Bueller has explained. I think it's, it's um, a very important opportunity for the town. Um, I think the investment is worth it. I think this will spur other development in town. Um, it's just, to me, a, an opportunity that may never come again in terms of this type of a company. So I strongly support the credit enhancement agreement and the, and the deal that you have uh, outlined, and I hope that the council sees it that way and agrees to uh, vote in favor of this, um, this agreement. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any others? I think. Yeah. If there's anybody else, could you line up, please, so we have an idea of the time? Sorry, Jen. <laughs> Hi. My name is Jennifer Ladd. I live at 12 Powderhorn Drive. Um, <clears throat> I'm a member of the town's transportation committee here. And um, I just, 
and through my professional career in another community, um, I have a lot of experience with the reinvestment of funds that companies like um, WEX stand to contribute. So things like um, you know, roadway improvements, sidewalk improvements, signal upgrades, things like that, that, um, you know, these are improvements that are required over time, <clears throat> but sometimes it's long after the, you know, the big splash of, an, of, of someone new coming to town. Um, but, but those needs don't go away. It's not a secret that our infrastructure here and elsewhere in Maine and everywhere else is, um, is aging at a rate that we're really not able to keep up with, with the, um, you know, local, state, and federal funds that were given for these improvements. So any opportunity that we have to sort of think creatively and work um, collaboratively with, you know, in our own communities and with partners that are interested in coming into these towns like ours, bringing their employees, um, reinvesting their, you know, their time um, and, and contributions in our community, but also helping out specifically with, with our infrastructure networks. I think it's really important. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, I just would echo a number of comments made previously by other folks here about things like the opportunity that this investment would bring for things like um, advancing sustainable and alternative transportation methods that we just, we really don't have a strong bus network, for example. Um, in Scarborough, it's here, but it's not, you know, it's not widely used and uh, a large anchoring corporate partner like WEX could, you know, could be sort of a catalyst for that and that would stand to benefit not only their employees but a lot of other people as well. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, again, attracting uh, the other sort of subsidiary businesses that would would definitely come here as a result of um, of a larger tenant like this, I think, um, I think are attractive. So I don't envy um, the work that you've had to do to get this far, but uh, as a resident here, I'm, I appreciate that, and I hope that um, I hope that this conversation continues, and uh, we're able to to continue to attract good corporate partners like this here. So thanks. Thank you. Any others? Any I, others? <laughs> 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 Thanks, Council. Uh, Katie Foley, 7 Acorn Lane. Um, so I have no intention of uh, speaking here and staying even for the rest of the council meeting this evening, but I missed you all so much. So, um, you know, when I think back to my time on the council and, and the, some of the tough decisions that came before us, um, none being more difficult than the vote on the downs itself. Um, that was by far and away the, the most difficult personal vote I had to take. And, um, but when I did that and I, and I took that vote, I, it was the big picture I was looking at. It was like, what is the, the net, what's going to happen tomorrow or three years or five years? I was looking at 15, 20, or 30 years down the road. Um, and for me, when I think about that part of that vote, it was because of something like this opportunity. And uh, I think sometimes it's easy to get lost in the um, piece of, well, I didn't want this to happen anyway. I didn't want, the, you know, the, let's just face it. Let's, I don't know if you guys have talked about this, but the elephant in the room is that if this council were voting on that same project today, it, it may not have happened at all. But here we are. So why not give the developers and this opportunity every chance it has to hit the grand slam that we were hoping for? Because I can tell you that that's what my vote was for. I didn't want them to get to first base or second base. I wanted them to hit all of those goals. And when they hit all of those goals, the whole town is going to benefit. Um, big picture. So um, I think there's been very good points made on all sides. And there's, there's certainly, this is not a cut and dry no brainer, um, but I would encourage you to support this because I do think it's the best way for us to maximize the full project. So, good luck. Thank you. Any more? No? Okay. With that, I will close public comment. Oh, Peter? Just, uh, we talked about reading units. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. There's one, there was one email that requested to be read into the public record, so. The individual wasn't available to be here tonight. It is Brian Cano at Six Old Colony Lane, and he just asked this to be read into the public record. Um, and I'm going to read it verbatim. It is time to let the Downs project stand on its own two feet and 
council meeting after council meeting, the Downs developers and some town councilors chanted that there would be no risk to the town if we gave $81 million tax break. This public-private partnership tax break was supposed to help ensure success of the Downs project, yet here we are again given another tax break to another wealthy developer, a new CEA for two point. Thank you. <laughs> two point two five million for a new WEX building on the Downs property. Who's next in line for a tax break? The planned Edge Sports facility, the planned hotel, the planned supermarket. We need to stop the corporate welfare. Let the Downs developers use the existing eighty one million tax break to entice new businesses. That's what it's for. Scarrow is one of the fastest growing and most desirable towns in all of Maine. We shouldn't have to pay businesses to come here. They should be willing to pay, they should be paying us. Town leaders need to have more confidence and faith in what we have to offer in Scarborough. If a new business decides not to come here, it is their loss and other business will take their place. So thank you for letting yeah, me sorry read that, that in. Yes, yeah. thank you. With that, I will close public comment. And before, point, point of yes. Um, we have had a lot of letters, not everybody came to speak, so. Yes. Yeah, we don't absolutely. read them all into yes. the record, yes. but we yes. read them all, yeah. Very, very good point. Yeah. With that, I'll close public hearing. Uh, what, is there any temperature amongst the council to make comments before I close it, since there's a large audience, and I think, no? Okay. Sure, I'll make, I'll make Well, if, if, if we choose not to as a group, then no. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take a five-minute recess because my hunch is everybody wants to, a very good <laughs> chunk of people in here want to leave. So I'm going to take a five-minute recess. We will reconvene at 8.03.
Okay, welcome back. We are back uh, from our brief five minute recess. We are on to order number 20.008, a 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the request to change a street name pursuant to chapter 309, the town of Scarborough street and development names and numbers ordinance <coughs> section four, renaming of an existing street. And I believe Councillor Hamill is gonna offer up a motion. I'd like to make a motion uh, that this be postponed uh, indefinitely, and tabled indefinitely. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? No discussion. no discussion. There's no discussion. All those in favor? <laughs> Order number 20016, public hearing and action on the new request for a food handler's license and liquor license from Alex Marquesas, DBA Cowbell Hospitality uh, 2 LLC, located at 185 US Route 1. And this is sponsored by the town clerk. Taps, I believe it was. Oh, right. Um, it's, uh, the applicant has um, filed a application. It's complete. Uh, we're recommending that it be approved and would be issued once the uh, certificate of occupancy has been issued to by the planning board, uh, pl planning and close, codes office. Just as an editorial note, this is a business that uh, has a current location. I think this will be a second location, but uh, they're currently in Pittsburgh Road and Main Street. Mm -hmm. As a third note, I think they're next to Tulu Salon and Spa, I think. Oh. <laughs> that oh. was probably illegal. I okay. <laughs> Do I have a motion? We need public So moved. Oh, I'm sorry, it's public sorry. hearing. Anybody? One of you guys? No? Nothing? <laughs> Seeing none, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion? Um, yep. I'll just say welcome to town. <laughs> Sounds good. Any more? All those in favor? Okay, moving on. First reading, uh, excuse me, order number 20017. First reading is scheduled a public hearing on the proposed amendments to Chapter 607, the Town of Scarborough Alarm Systems Ordinance, and to repeal Chapter 607A, the Town of Scarborough Fire Suppression and Detection Ordinance. And this is brought to us from the Ordinance Committee and our Fire Chief. Chief, uh, Thurlow oh, the is chief, here. Yeah. In the, maybe best room to introduce. Yeah. Good evening. As I explained to the ordinance committee when we uh, met with them, this really is, uh, does a couple of different things. It cleans up two ordinances and combines them into one. And it is really driven by the fact that as part of the public safety building uh, process for the new facility, we needed to make a decision about our old legacy municipal fire alarm system. We've had a uh, hardwired copper wire on the telephone pole system for over 50 years now that has served us very well. Um, but when it came time to look at the design of the new building, there was a significant expense to move that infrastructure from there to here. And also the, the ongoing expense of maintaining a hardwired system versus modern technology that is based on radio mesh uh, technology. So during the design phase of the building, uh, the committee looked at it and we decided that it really was time to replace our old system. So a lot of the language in here um, deals with that specific new system. Uh, we use the, the fire alarm system covers all of the municipal buildings and many of the school buildings, uh, the sanitary district is on it. But we also for years have allowed private businesses that were in the vicinity where those wires ran to jump onto our system as well at no cost over the years because the system was there and it was sending the signal into dispatch anyway. With this new system now, um, it is still gonna be a direct connection to dispatch. Uh, it is a much more modern and easier to maintain and less expensive to maintain system. Uh, and we think that um, now it opens it up to pretty much any business in town can jump onto the system because you don't have to be on a road where that wire runs by your front door. So we're, we're uh, the language in here uh, takes care of compliance and the, the language necessary for the new system and it also combines those two ordinances together. With that, I'm certainly happy to answer any questions. Council Gleising? 
There is, uh, it isn't necessarily in the ordinance, but as part of the request, I have asked the clerk um, to add uh, fees into the fee schedule because that's where those are kept during the budget process. Um, what, we are, what we have done historically is dispatch has always monitored that system at no charge to any of the users. Because there are software um, service agreements and maintenance agreements for the equipment, we are asking for a nominal fee that is in line or actually a little less expensive than monitoring through a private uh, company. And those fees are $500 per year uh, to monitor for either fire or burglary. If you wanted to monitor for both, it would be $750 a year and a one-time initial permitting and commissioning fee because it's a, it's a piece of hardware that you have to attach to your fire alarm system and then folks from public safety have to program that into our system and there is a commissioning process. So that fee covers the cost of the fire inspector actually going out and uh, testing the system and the hardware and the back office work to get it into our system so that everything works well. Can I just a follow-up to that? So in terms of all the changes, is there any, do you expect any net impact cost to the town, increased or decreased? Or? We think over time we probably will generate more revenue as the system starts to build out and more businesses are interested in going this way. We think probably the revenues will exceed the expenses in the budget that I'm working with the police chief on now for this next fiscal year. We're going to budget a, a net neutral uh, amount just based on where we are with the number of subscribers that I'm comfortable predicting revenues from uh, and the annual expense for that software and upkeep of the system. So there won't be any additional revenues in this next fiscal year, but I think as the system grows, there probably will be some. Yeah. Councilor Clucci. Uh, yeah, so I'm just really interested in this. I, uh, I have a motel and we have a monitoring system. Are you kind of cutting out the middleman with, with this new technology? It does. Okay. It, and what we've told the folks on our existing system is you don't have to come with us. You certainly can continue uh, or can change and have a third party, uh, hire one of the third party folks to monitor for you. But this is another option for you. And one of the, the, some of the language in the ordinance, actually there are some occupancies, some of the high hazard occupancies that we are requiring to monitor through this. So the schools, for instance, they're already taken care of, but there are a list of other um, high hazard occupancies where we just don't want that additional delay. And this was monitored, this was uh, not monitored, <laughs> modeled after the city of, South of Portland and some other um, communities that were doing something similar so that dispatch was actually getting those signals within seconds rather than waiting for the signal to go to a third party system, having an operator from out of state or out of the country calling saying, you know, this is what's going on at the building across the street. So kind of a crazy follow up. My, my business is in Old Orchard. We share dispatch. Is there opportunity for businesses in Old Orchard to hop onto this system? There, there likely will be going forward. Yes. Yep. Good to know. <laughs> Councilor Johnson. Chief, uh, what's the number of subscribers we have now? Do you know? Commercial, commercial side. Separate from the municipal? Yes. And non municipal, private companies, do you know? I don't have that information in front of me, Councilor. I'm guessing that it's in the maybe 15 to 20. Oh, okay. So a it's not a huge it's number. Not a big and out of that list, we've been working with these folks for over a year now. We started right. back in December of 18th to let them know that this change was coming. Um, I think we've got maybe six or eight that have committed to come with a new system. We've got a, a bunch of the rest that have decided to go third party. Okay. Well, I, I, I had somebody contact me, so I, I'm just going to ask you what he had asked me. Apparently, he's up in the Dunstan area now, so I think the assumption is hardwired into the Dunstan station. Is that correct? It was correct years ago. Okay. My predecessor, a number of years ago, allowed that particular occupancy to connect to the Dunstan Fire Station. Right. We upgraded that fire alarm system, I can't remember now, three, four years ago. Okay. And at that time, they, that occupancy put their own system in so that we weren't bearing the liability of monitoring right. a non-town owned building. Okay. in case that connection ever gets So severed. nobody's hardwired to Dunstan anymore. You're, they're directly coming in they're, the old system. They're hardwired into the old system, right. but it's from their own fire alarm panel yep. 
only taking care of their occupants. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any more? Yep. Councilor Caterina? Could you remind me, Chief, can private residences uh, apply or, or get onto this program if they wish? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Any more? Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Oh, I was just going to say that this was vetted in ordinance and we think it's a good idea. So I just want to let okay. you know that. Any more? All those in favor? Thank you. Uh, order number 20018, first reading and schedule a public hearing on the proposed amendments to chapter 303. The Scarborough Personnel Ordinance, and this is brought to us from the Ordinance Committee and Human Resources. And I assume Mr. Gallagher will tee this up for us. Mm -hmm. uh, good evening, Liam Gallagher, uh, Director of Human Resources. Um, there are two proposed changes before the Council this evening um, pertaining to Chapter 303 of the Personnel Ordinance, um, specifically Section 302 which is the uh, provision for overtime and compensatory leave in section 515, which is speaking to uh, the retirement provision. So um, the, the proposed changes look somewhat simple in, um, within their edits, uh, but there's, there's, there's obviously a level of complexity, I think, to evaluating the proposal. Um, so I'll try to go do a high level overview of what we're talking about, the concept behind it. Um, uh, there's been a request out of ordinance committee for some uh, financial analysis to give a better idea what the impact could be um, and then answer any questions that the council has. So um, the first uh, change to section 302 um, again seems very simplistic. It's essentially to replace uh, compensatory leave for holiday leave for the purposes of calculating overtime. So this whole formula around uh, hours worked in terms of a work week um, you know, essentially our, our uh, ordinance speaks to beyond just purely hours worked, what counts as hours worked for the purposes of hitting that 40 hour <coughs> threshold. Uh, so as it stands now, all other accruals are factored into that, that calculation except for holiday time. Um, the thing that's a bit unique about that uh, is that holiday time is really the only time off that we don't really give employees the option to take or not. Um, so we you know we have a, week, a work week where there's a holiday on a Monday, um, we tell everyone to stay home, um, and then generally the concept around overtime is we are, we are asking uh, or burdening an employee to work over and above their regular schedule. Um, so I attempted to provide uh, one illustrative example in my memorandum to this concept and why we think it's, it's problematic and, and um, unfair on some level. Um, it's something that, in, in my experience, uh, I've, I've never seen holiday time as, a, as an accrual that doesn't count for this calculation. Um, I've seen lots of policies and contracts that exclude you know, sick leave or compensatory leave or, or other forms, but never holiday, um, because that is one that's scheduled for time off. Um, so that's, uh, you know, in terms of why removing compensatory leave, I've, I've provided an example of why I think that's problematic to include it, this idea of being able to pyramid your time off. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with uh, public sector uh, wage and hour laws, uh, one unique component for public sector employers is that they, they do allow employees to uh, earn time off in lieu of overtime pay. So they work you know, 42 hours in a work week, rather than taking two hours of overtime, they can get three hours of comp time, put it on the books. That next pay period, they take three hours off, they work some additional overtime, they can kind of compound or multiply that. So um, that's why we're proposing this um, sort of replacement or, or switch, if you will. Um, so that's the, the high level. I'm not sure if the council would like me to talk about uh, sort of a model fiscal impact around this provision before I move on to the next change or, or whether, like I said, defer to the chair or, or Councillor Hamill. Uh, I've had the opportunity to uh, go through this with Liam in some detail and have shared some of the information with, uh, with the chair. Uh, you know, the, the costs are, are nominal for this. Uh, I've also consulted uh, Mike Shaw, you know, his group would be one of the largest groups affected potentially. And so, you know, the impacts are somewhere around, you know, we estimate $5,000 in terms of the swap. You have to evaluate the cost of the new way to calculate it with an offset of people, you know, how, 
how often they're going to choose to take the compensatory time instead. So the so I would say this is a it's a minimal expense, and um, you know Mike uh, Mike Shaw supports it uh, as well. So we felt that this was a, a reasonable request. The, the big point about this is that it is a. a parity issue for non-bargaining unit staff, uh, in addition to being somewhat of an employee recognition matter. So that's an important f feature for us as well. So I, I just thought I'd add those points. Uh, great. Yeah, great points. And, and that was a piece that I, that I overlooked in my introduction that um, looking at the three other, we really have four major employee groups in town. We have a, a large group of non-bargaining employees for which this ordinance sort of speaks to the terms and conditions of employment. And we have three collectively bargained uh, units. And in all of those contracts, um, holiday time is regarded as hours work for the purposes of overtime. So this is really an, mm -hmm. an equity component to it as well. Uh, why don't I move on to um, the second proposed change before the council. Um, to give some background on, on this, um, you know, this was not a, a change that came to us. This is the result of a, uh, a legislative uh, policy or rule change at the main public employees retirement system level. Um, essentially what it states is uh, that if, if a uh, public or participating local district, which are municipal employers, employs someone who is uh, defined as a retiree returned to work by the main PERS system. So this is someone who um, has retired from another PLD employer or, or in fact the PLD employer that's re-employing them um, and is actively collecting a benefit from the system, then the employer is ob obligated to remit a 5%, what they call a UAL or unfunded actuarial liability payment to the system. It's essentially a penalty. Um, the retiree receives no benefit from that. That's not adding to their service. It's not adding to their, to their income. Essentially, uh, the, the background to this was, uh, you know, as most pension systems, again, you know, if you, you don't have to, to read too far in terms of uh, government budget news, but most pension systems have a challenge of staying uh, adequately funded. Um, and they identified this, this idea of employers re-employing retirees as sort of having a double impact to them. Not only are they uh, losing money from the fund, if you will, by paying a, a benefit to a retiree, they're collecting a pension, but they're essentially holding a seat from someone who otherwise could be contributing to the plan. Um, so they saw this as the remedy uh, to, to solve some of that um, sort of drain on the, on the system. So, um, you know, by, by main public employees retirement system, there's, a, there's an incredible amount of flexibility uh, at the local level with how to handle this. Uh, they essentially say, as long as we get our 5%, who funds that, whether that's the employee or the retiree in this case, or the employer, doesn't much matter to us. Um, however, I, this is being brought forward at the council level so that we can have consistency across how we're gonna address this issue. Um, you know, the other uh, factor here and, and as proposed, what we would say is that uh, if you meet this definition of a retiree return to work, then you become ineligible for our 4RNA plan. However, we will pay this 5% on your behalf. Um, sort of the, the thought process or the, the hypothesis behind this change is that if you have someone who's actively collecting a pension, perhaps you know, saving for a secondary retirement's not as, um, as important to them as possibly receiving a, a paycheck at the time, um, and you know this idea that they're going to pay a five percent on their own, uh, deducted from their wages, for which they see no benefit, on top of you know a six percent contribution to a, a retirement plan with a vesting schedule, just doesn't seem as as practical or pragmatic uh, for me. So um, that's sort of the concept behind this proposal. Um, you know, in terms of the fiscal impact uh, by eliminating their opportunity to participate in the 401a plan, which is a one-to-one -one match at six percent. We essentially have a 1% realized savings overall, or at least a uh, potential exposure to that liability. So I'm happy to answer any questions regarding that change. Well, Councilor Caterina? Uh, just for clarification Please. for the public, and I'm sorry if you said it, I get distracted for a second. How many people is this affecting right now? Yeah, so we have about 100 non-union full-time employees. Um, and in terms of actually uh, this provision, uh, we have one person yeah. who meets the staff initiative of retiree okay. return to work. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. Is there a motion on the table? Uh, move approval. Second. 
Discussion? Um, this came out of, I'm sorry, <laughs> this came out of ordinance. <laughs> we looked at it and asked our various questions, whatever, and we felt that these were fine. These were good changes, so. <laughs> so I just had one suggestion. Uh, in the future, I think it would be helpful if we do these as separate um, orders. So, I mean, they, I know we put them together because they were personal ordinance changes, but nah, they're different enough that I think it might be more uh, efficient in our discussion and easier to keep some of the technical issues and questions separate. So just mm -hmm. a small request procedurally, but I'm in favor of both of these. Yeah, I think I'll just say, uh, Councilor Hamill, thank you. I, you did a, I don't know if everybody saw it, but you did do some extra legwork just to yeah. get a, an idea of the costs. And I, I believe you forwarded that to everybody. Yeah, I did. So yeah. I do appreciate you answering that question before it gets brought here to help thank us you. make this. Decision. I just might add that my learning curve is still steep as yeah. I become accustomed yeah. to the public sector. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> With that, all those in favor? All right. Order number 2019, act on the request for excuse me, from the police chief to accept the following two grants given by the state of Maine. First grant is to subsidize for substance use disorder in the amount of $457,928. And the second on would deal, and the second would deal with domestic violence and human, human trafficking in the amount of $41,590. Combined total of 44, excuse me, $499,518. And Chief Moulton, would you like to tee this up for us? Good evening. Um, a while back, we there was a, an introduction from the state uh, that they were looking uh, for proposals for approximately seven hundred fifty thousand dollars of grant money that they had available for uh, substance use uh, disorder related programs and. Um, we, uh, we decided to look at that and see um, what we might be able to put together. And um, so we uh, put this proposal together for slightly more than the 457,000, um, but we were one of three people that, uh, three uh, places that put in proposals and the other two were, uh, were uh, smaller proposals and they were full funded and um, so uh, when it came to ours, they they liked the program. They uh, cut us back about twelve thousand dollars, and um, it, and uh, so the, I think you have the memo before you. But the uh, the proposal uh, or the grant basically will allow us to um, carry forward with what we're doing now, with uh, uh, providing people with treatment and and travel and so forth. Um, one of the things that we are going to do is open up a little because over time we've come to realize that the real villain here is, is the addiction, is mm -hmm. the substance use disorder, the, the disease, not necessarily a particular substance. Yeah, clearly we started this because heroin was such an issue and people were dying um, rapidly, um, but there are many other substances that folks have come in looking for help that we have um, to this point turned away and because we weren't sure we, where we are operating on grants and donations, we weren't sure we would have the money to support uh, going open it up anymore. Um, with this, uh, with this grant, we will uh, slowly start to to do that and try to assist other people that are struggling. Um, so that's what part of the money is for. Then uh, we looked at what else could we do, and one of the issues that. Uh, folks have when they, many of the people that come to us uh, r literally have the clothes on their back when, when they go to treatment. And, um, and it's great that they get there and get treatment, but they come back home and they're in that same situation. And it's very difficult and, and very stressful when they come back to try to get reestablished when they have nothing to, to start with. So one of the things that we um, have talked a lot about with people in the recovery community and so forth is the ability to provide a limited amount of time. We certainly don't want to give an amount of time that would, would enable folks to any degree, but a limited amount of time for somebody coming back, that might be 30 days, that might be 60 days. It depends really on the, on the uh, situation, but simply to have a safe, sober house to, to go to, to get reestablished so that they can start looking at work opportunities, start finding an apartment or, or a place on their own, 
um, and just get reacclimated to, to society. So that's, uh, that's part of the money. We also, um, my ultimate goal is that I would like to package up a program that we could hand off uh, to either the state or if not the state regionally, maybe to the, uh, to the county um, and show a model that works and, and a comprehensive model that works. And, uh, but to do that, I think we need to, to show, to be able to, to provide some data to show uh, what the success really looks like. To this point, we haven't been able to do that because it's only uh, a couple of us that are, that are working on it aside from our regular responsibilities. So we just haven't had the time to go back. Anecdotally, I can tell you that a lot of people come in, thank us um, for, for the treatment tell us we've saved their lives, we've saved their granddaughter's lives, we've, uh, and we get letters and that type of thing. So, and we have done some follow-up, but not a systematic follow-up. So part of this money would be to, uh, to hire, um, to provide a salary and benefit package for a one-year um, project manager uh, to do follow-up and, uh, and to see what our successes have really looked like so that we could, in fact, give a model that we know is, is uh, uh, we could explain uh, and provide a model that shows some success. So that's uh, the money in there for the salary and benefit. And we also, uh, I, and, and I would say too, that uh, these grants were written by uh, the social services navigator that you, uh, you provided the funding for in our last budget. And, She's doing some really good work, and she's really hit the ground running. Um, and these were two successful grants on her part. And so one of the one of the other pieces of that would be if we were to get that position, um, she would like to work. Uh, when I say she, I say this, the the Lauren, our social services navigator, would like to work with that person to start a lead program, which is a law enforcement assisted diversion program. So, which would allow us to deal with people who may have some minor uh, trouble with the law and, and before they get into the court system, be able to provide some treatment or some assistance if they need it. And uh, also to, uh, for our officers, when they identify somebody who's going down that path, maybe they haven't been arrested yet, but it's very clear that that's the path that they're going. Um, and these would be voluntary things, very voluntary programs, but. Um, we feel that there would be people that would take advantage of them. And then um, when Steffi was here earlier and talked about Project Grace, uh, for those of you who've been around for a while, you know that Project Grace was uh, founded by a lady named Karen Packham. Mm -hmm. And uh, her husband, Dave, has been very interested, she and her husband, Dave, have been very interested in, uh, in starting a pilot uh, project around um, substance use messaging particularly in our schools. Um, we certainly have had the DARE program around for a long time, but that messaging is outdated and, mm -hmm. and we're really looking uh, ultimately for a K-12 K messaging. But the pilot uh, program that Dave has put together is to is five communities. It's, it's Scarborough, uh, Bath, uh, Wyndham, Gorham, and Yarmouth. And the... Uh, the administrators for those school districts are all on board with this and what we're going to try to do is roll out a program for the next school year and so we're working through that now but for, for, as an example one of the things that they're talking about doing is having a um, having a contest of those five high schools for students to come up with an age-appropriate messaging around uh, substance use, maybe a 30 second uh, public service announcement. And it not have to be done with any professional, just on, a, on an iPhone or, or I mean, just a phone or whatever. And um, then they would compete against people from their own school district and the winner would get a, uh, would get a cash prize and then those, uh, maybe a thousand dollars, and then those folks would compete, those five people from the different school districts would compete for another cash prize. And then uh, the winner of that, that PSA, and maybe more than one, um, with some of this funding from this grant would go towards having that uh, PSA professionally uh, done, produced, so that, and buying some airtime so that that could air on some of the local news stations and so forth. Because we, we believe that we have got to reach our young folks at a younger age, and we believe that we've got to um, come up with some 
some um, modern day messaging that's going to fight off the messaging that they see on TV every day, which is you've got to drink alcohol, have a good time, you've got to, uh, now it's vaping, it's this, it's that, it's something else. This messaging is, is kind of being driven down uh, these kids' throats, and we're not providing anything to, to fight that off. So that, in a nutshell, that's, uh, that's what we plan on doing with that grant. I would say that uh, there is one more step to the grant that has to go back to the uh, procurement division just to make sure that everything was done properly. I don't see any issues with that at all. I expect that uh, we'll get the official notification, uh, but that is, uh, we do have to wait on that. And then the other grant uh, that we were talking about is a domestic violence and um, human trafficking grant. Uh, there's, a, there's a fairly significant problem with human trafficking in Cumberland County and the the new, the new uh, district attorney is, um, is really um, encouraging departments to move forward in that direction. And so that grant money, the uh, 41000 would be for overtime for our special enforcement folks to be able to uh, do those types of details and also uh, for officers who have to go do follow-up uh, domestic violence uh, follow-up visits. Um, with our social services navigator, they would do that rather than take somebody off the road that we're counting on for patrol. We could do that as, a, as an overtime detail. And both of these grants are reimbursable grants, so we would be obligated to spend the money and then uh, and then be reimbursed for it. Questions? Yes, Chief, I had a question for you. Uh, sure. Um, on the uh, and, and you know thanks for locating these grants and going through all the work to to obtain this money one of them uh, is for a one-year salary this this one that's the seventy thousand dollar one is that right correct so what's the expectation after the end of the grant would that be an assumption that we would have a full-time position or somehow have to fund that or what would we do no, uh, I, I think uh, I think in a year's time we would be able to develop some mechanisms for doing that follow-up, um, and uh, and we would be able to reach out to those 400 and some odd people that we have placed in treatment to this point, and get the follow-up done with them. Moving forward, I think we would be able to accomplish that uh, without that position. The the plan would be. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. No, we, we would not plan on trying to fund that position beyond that one year. We're looking for, we're looking, and, and it's going to take the right individual to be able to do that and knowing up front that it's a one year um, type of position. But there are folks out there that, that are engaged and are willing to do that. Okay, and the, the one other question I had, Chief, if I may, the, there's a 41,590 that you've identified that would be, a, you know, a, uh, salary and overtime expense. Uh, so is that something you plan to submit as part of your budget this year or how are we planning to fund that? Yeah, I mean, if, if when we get the official notification of this, that's something that we would, we have grant accounts now that we run. So we would be looking for something net uh, uh, neutral. So we would be putting in expenses that would go with that and offsetting that with because this is new overtime, this is not overtime that we're expending now. We're using regular patrol officers to do that, but this is an opportunity <coughs> to have that funded so that we can keep people on the road and still accomplish those tasks. And arguably these costs would not be incurred but for grant support. I see. You would be doing additional I understand. details. To... Councilor Hayes? Yeah, it, it's really just kind of a... It was the same question I think Council Hamlin had. So you've answered there's 75, but the 82,000 for a pilot, and then my question around the 41,000. These, as long as the expectations are managed, that these are just for this grant, but not necessarily woven into the fabric. I know sometimes grants have a way of creeping over into standard. Yeah. Business. No, I hear you, but, but no, that's, that's not up, that's not the intent. Yeah. So, that's not so the intent. your answer on the 75, I'm assuming, is similar to the 82 and the 41 clear that this is for the grant or a designated project yeah we're, we're hoping that we can get that uh, pilot project rolled out there and and get buy some airtime and do those kind of things and get some messaging rolling and and uh, then we'll have done our work great thank you can the can the 756 be a 
a one-year contractor? I mean, does it have to be a salary and benefit position? or it, Not that it necessarily matters to me, but I, I'm, what I'm hearing sure. is... Sure, we put it together as, as salary and benefits as a one-year yeah, thing. Yeah. Certainly, um, yeah. The nature of it just seems more yeah. of a contractor. There would be very clear expectations uh, through the recruitment process and certainly the hiring that it is right. a grant-funded sort of soft money position, that it is a short-term duration. Right. Councillor Kluge? So I, I think it's fantastic that you're getting grants to do all of this work. To, to some extent, it seems like it, it, it's a part of our responsibility as a town to take care of some of this stuff. So I understand it's a pilot program and that it's going to be funded through the grants today. If the pilot's successful and uh, you, you are able to demonstrate that there's a benefit to doing it, would you see positions ultimately coming out of this so that instead of funding this through grants, this is funded through our regular processes and ways of doing business? Um, I, I, would, I would say no at this point. Like I say, uh, on the on the one position that we're talking about, the the, the eighty two thousand that we're talking about for for uh, the messaging and so forth is not a position or anything. It's airtime and and um, providing the prizes for that type of contest and and uh, that type of thing, pamphlets, all of that kind of uh, thing. And I think if that was successful, I think that there would be um, other. Number one, other communities, but I think there may be businesses too that would get behind that and, and assist with that. So we're hoping it's a pilot that catches on. The, the idea was that um, if we could get these five communities and, and show that this can work, that maybe this would be uh, Gordon Smith, who's the substance use uh, czar for the, for the state. Um, has talked to us a lot about this, and I think if uh, I think if this pilot worked, it's something that they would want to take and uh, and maybe expand on more of a statewide basis. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, what about how many people? So this is the, you'd be working with Scarborough residents, right? This isn't like the community at large. This is was for Scarborough residents that the, the current treatment and travel and the. The, the, the sober living program and all that that's for Scarborough residents no. right no it's not no oh. we've we've had people from all over the state um, coming to us okay so, so it's a it's how, how do they come to you how does that how, how do they yeah um, word of mouth I think uh, it, people hear about the program and and so they uh, they have come here there are other programs throughout the state similar programs okay but we've been pretty successful and people recognize that and so they they tend to come to us so about how many people do you think you'll impact I mean with these programs what what numbers are are you looking at now and in the future it, it's really hard to say when we um, we have a we have a fair amount of people that we turn away now um, because we're not really set up to, to deal with something other than opioids. Um, I don't know what that will look like when, when that word gets out, and that's why we have not, to this point, um, done that, mm -hmm. because we didn't know what was going to happen, and we didn't have that kind of funding to, to support if all of a sudden we had a lot of people coming. Chief, can you speak to the number that you... you yeah. So yeah, for yeah, it's a, a little over 400 that we've actually placed in treatment um, since we started in in November of October 15, November yeah, 15. 15. Um, we've probably had, uh, uh, I would say, 900 to 1,000 folks that have come in, um, but we don't we don't take everybody that comes in. We do a screening process, mm -hmm. and there are reasons why there are some people that we won't accept into the program or can't accept into the program. Um, so, uh, and then there are people that are just not ready. And part of our screening process is to is to um, you know sit down and talk with them about their commitment and their uh, mm -hmm. their enthusiasm for this. And there are folks that come in that are brought in by their husbands, wives, brothers, sisters, grandparents, whatever. And uh, all of those people want this really, really bad, except for the person that, that actually needs it. And in those situations, we recognize that fairly readily, and, uh, and we're not able to, uh, it's not that we're not able, I, I just don't think it's good policy 
to, to spend. Um, we're trying to be good shepherds of the money that's been donated or granted to us, and and so um, it, it, when somebody is uh, showing that they're probably not going to be successful, we're we're not sending them. And I'm sure you have people working on this, but if you if you want to get young people, probably TV. They don't watch TV anymore or the radio. <laughs> it's yeah. Getting yeah, to them is going to be a whole different. It's easy. Uh, it's TikTok. You're done. It's easy. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. TikTok. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, no, you're right. And, we, and, and we're, we're aware of all those things. The one thing that we felt that n not just the kids, but parents too, um, do tend to watch is local news. So we were, uh, that's one of the things that we were looking at airtime in that particular category. But th those are all things that um, we're working through now. They're, they're just, ideas at this point but right. uh, there are ideas that we're trying to trying to move forward um, Dave is uh, as Karen is too um, they're real doers and, yeah, uh, and they have really taken an interest in this they want to move it forward and they're the type of people that really uh, can make things happen I just want to provide uh, just a bit of background and yeah. I appreciate that many of you on council now weren't on when this program started, uh, I really credit Chief Moulton and his staff for recognizing a, a need, not knowing what the depth and the severity of that need, or much less how to deal with it, but uh, doing something totally different. And um, for law enforcement to do the sort of uh, work that they're doing, kind of the social service work, is a whole mindset change. And I credit Chief for showing the leadership on this. Um, Councils through the years have have supported it. The chief has um, essentially done this without uh, local taxpayer support. It's right. all been done through uh, grants and donations. Um, and the goal has always been to find a better model. You know, this was never, this is not sustainable. We know that from the first day we started, but they're still showing up in our front door looking for help. And frankly, there's not another solution, regional, much less statewide. So the fact that we secured 75% of the available state uh, money statewide should suggest to you the level of confidence mm -hmm. they have in Chief Moulton. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the state's benefit, but also for ours, we truly need to find a better model to be able to replicate this to reach uh, more people. So mm -hmm. I credit his steadfast uh, leadership on this, but it's time for us to pass the torch on to someone that can do it and provide even more impact. Mm -hmm. And this grant will really set the table for that, we hope. Thank you. And, and the reason that we broke it up the way we did is, is that I, it, it really is um, more than just providing the treatment and travel that we have. I, it, I've always said, I think this is, you know, we need the prevention education, we need the enforcement, and we need the, uh, the treatment and so forth. They've all got to be in place in order for, for us to find our way out of this. Yeah, um, congratulations on the grant. Thank I remember you. I was on the council when we green-lighted the original Operation Hope, um, and you're far too modest uh, about it. It was really the first program in the state. It was modeled after a program in Gloucester, Massachusetts, um, and it has taken off in the state. And when I'm talking to the program, I talk about Operation Hope. Um, I know individuals who've been helped by this program um, and the ramifications are wide, broad and wide, and we'll never know sometimes, you know, the success we've had. But I, I just, I'm just absolutely thrilled that you were able to land this amount of money. This is a big chunk of money for a grant, for mm -hmm. almost $500,000. And I also like the, um, the youth factor of it and letting the kids take the lead, so to speak, because they'll know where it needs to go, like TikTok or, <laughs> or whatever. Um, so kudos. I think it's awesome. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you, sir. Is there a motion on the table? So moved. A second? Second. Discussion? Councilor Hamill? Yes, I uh, just you know wanted to echo the comments that uh, several have made about uh, kudos to Chief and the uh, the innovation and uh, uh, to try to find a solution for this problem that really touches everybody. Uh, and it's clear there are unmet needs. So, uh, so we appreciate that. We've made a commitment to that. Um, so don't, I don't want my questions about cost to be misinterpreted. Uh, yet at the same time, I want to make sure that we follow a process for f factoring in the costs associated with grants. This is not, you know, not cost neutral. 
and there aren't any savings that I see. It represents staff additions and other potentially and, and other uh, uh, salary and benefits costs uh, that may be incurred and there may be growth of this. And certainly the need, the demand is going to increase. So I, I just want to make sure we, we model that and we, we have that go through the same approval process that we will be following for the budget this year. So. No, I, I, I echo Councillor Hamill's comments. I'm pretty well satisfied, I think, from this particular mm -hmm. case that I don't think we run the danger of creep, so to speak, mm -hmm. or a, right. of a position that's created and then, and then essentially assumed to be renewed in perpetuity. I think there's, if you look back on the, the back page of the pilot program, I see lots of crossover with the DARE program, updating the DARE program. If this is successful, maybe the DARE officers adapt more of the SEED program or what have you. So mm -hmm. there seems to me there could be lots of lateral movement in staff if something does take off. But um, I, the last thing I want to say is a lot of times we talk about what's our return on investment. So, you know, that navigator position was one of discussion this year, and it's great to see that we, had, we invested, I believe, of somewhere in the neighborhood of $75,000 all in on that neighborhood, um, excuse me, on the navigator position. And here we're looking at a half million dollar grant. So right. that's a good ROI as far as I'm concerned. So, okay, with that, uh, all those in favor? Okay, order number 2020, act on request from the Shellfish Com Commission to approve the allocations of Shellfish, licen sh shellfish <laughs> Licenses for 2020. Uh, and I believe Mr. Harbormaster is here to speak to us real quick. It's never <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Rosati. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, the Shellfish Committee this year uh, is asking to leave the num same number of licenses that were issued last year. Uh, there was discussion about it, uh, an increase, uh, but that was held. Uh, just so you're aware, the Shellfish Committee, in, we have engaged in uh, surveys this year, as well as some other conservation projects. And right now we're working with Down East Institute to, in, to bring in some uh, larger conservation projects. So I think the committee has fulfilled their you know, obligation to, to do the conservation end. Um, the other thing that I was happy with this, uh, with no increase, is that we're anticipating maybe two or three uh, licenses that are gonna become available, resident commercial licenses. Um, so even though they didn't increase the number of licenses, there are in fact going to be some become available. So. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Councillor Hayes? <laughs> I don't miss those conversations necessarily, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, but a question for you, just generally, you know, I know a lot of times part of it is just really trying to figure out what is the health of the flats and is it producing, you know, and I know that's part of the surveys and trying to get a handle on that. But on the landings and other things, have, has production been pretty steady? Has it been increasing, decreasing? I think we're on track. Um, last year, Scarborough brought in the most clams in the state by a few. Mm -hmm. um, we landed. Um, I think we're on track right now. I will tell you there's a couple areas getting a little thin. Um, the other thing that I'm working on uh, with, the count, with the committee chairman is to protect upper clay pits. Yeah. Um, traditionally, what's happened is uh, we, we were involved in the water sampling and testing program. Uh, upper clay pits, and that's what we used to call the donut hole, has been closed. Uh, there was a sewage leak a couple of years ago. That testing is becoming closer to being opened. Normally, what happens is the decoration crew will come in and take all the clams, and then the next water test is clean, and it's open and there's no clams left for Scarborough diggers. So we're also filing for a pollution abatement uh, closure on that as well to add. So I, I think we'll be okay going forward. Um, this year surveys, when they're completed, and then we'll have the data to look at the two surveys and that's when you get the, the true picture. Was there, was there any conversations of if those 
two or three licenses do become available? Are they going to at least pause and take a look at, will some of that data you just referenced be available by that? Because I think the real concern is, is that there's always been that, you know, we don't want to overfish. And if you say some of the areas are getting thin. A little bit, yeah. That, that might mean we're kind of at that critical point. In the and these are record landings that have been coming in, you're saying? We were the most in the state. Yeah, but is that, how does it compare to prior years higher? Um, higher than prior years. So, so, so we're taking more off. So, I mean, I, I guess that would be my only question is whether they're, they're, they're going to pause it and consider if they do have two or three licenses that become available to hold and some of that survey data is available. Um, the, like I said, the discussions were had. Um, there was talk of actually maybe increasing by one. As you know, they're a valuable commodity. So, um, and it was decided to stay uh, status quo. And part of the reason for that was because we're going to have some of these become available. So it is an opportunity for other folks to, through the lottery process, to perhaps secure a resident commercial license. As far as the numbers go, once we have the next set of surveys done, then we can compare data. Right now, we only have one survey completed. So to answer your question, I, I, I guess you know the, the question on the table, I would say that leaving the number of licenses the same, in my opinion, will be OK. I don't think we need to hold back or decrease, if you will out of line to ask if we could have that data prior to next year's grant once level. the surveys are done yes I know but we, I mean that I mean as you as these conversations have progressed mm -hmm. this was an ask two or three, I, it's, it's been a long time in coming getting to the data so I'm just wondering if us I think putting some type of caveat saying next year it'd be great to have that data would help move that that was the purpose of doing the surveys but unfortunately we only have one to start with um, the committee you know the, in, within the last year um, a little bit of pushing I think has moved back into the conservation role that they are supposed to fulfill and are actually seeking you know these conservation projects so which is ultimately to protect the flats to protect the, the numbers and you know, keep that balance of what we're taking and what's growing uh, in, in balance. Um, you know, I think they're really trying to do the best they can. Uh, so. Any more? No? Okay. Is there a motion on the table? So moved. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Nope. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Just, just yeah. a discussion. And actually, Kessel Hill, I think you're the, you're the liaison to, is there, is, there, is there a way to kind of really emphasize the importance of getting that survey data so that we actually have some numbers we can look at? Yeah, I think that's a, a fair a fair request. Uh, I don't know, Angela, but the, some some of the issues that have to do with people doing the surveys is that the is that the problem or? The, uh, no, we don't have a problem. I'll get the survey done. Um, the the last one that was scheduled for the year um, was was um, postponed by the committee because everybody had already had their conservation time in. Yeah. Um, so. What we did is we, we, when we set out to do the first survey, we started with the, with the areas that needed that the most. And knowing that if we didn't get to the end, that those areas at the end were okay and, and we, could, we could work around that. That was by design. So I, I just think what, if I understand what Peter's driving at here is just sort of if there's a, any way for us to utilize the survey data to, to make it, you know, to have some facts to back up our, our assumptions. And I trust you guys, uh, you know, know the, know the territory better than anybody. And I, so I trust your, you know, your assessment and your recommendation. But I think where, where possible, wherever we have data to support that would be very helpful. I mean, Mr. Hayes' question is a very fair question. 
I, I you know I just can't I can't give them the answer right now because I don't have the two data to compare. Mm -hmm. The surveys will be done. They've already been scheduled. Um, they were scheduled. Ahead, they're already scheduled ahead of time. Mm -hmm. and in fact, we extended the conservation year, if you will, mm -hmm. so we could get that last survey in mm -hmm. is, as needed. Mm -hmm. So, and that's by design. Um, as you know, I pushed for these because I know that you folks, at times, you need numbers to, to deal with and you need numbers to be able to look at and, and make a good vote, um, you know, other than taking it on faith. So hopefully next year we can bring you that data and, and uh, good hard data and it'll come together. Council Gucci? Uh, yeah, sorry. Since we're on the topic, I, uh, this isn't my forte. Uh, but can you explain to me, with, does the number of licenses correlate with the, the number of clams that are taken out of the, the beds, or are there caps, or quotas, or... Uh-oh. <laughs> Was that too hard? No, no. no. <laughs> A very, a very quick answer is yes. That's the number of licenses are set um, year to year. There hasn't been much change in the last couple of years. Um, they are set by what the landings are, and what the surveys tell us is we can predict that we know what's going to be there, you know, six months from now or next season. Um, one of the things that's bad about digging clams is when you're digging clams, you're killing clams. <coughs> so you always have to have that balance tip that you're not killing more, you know, so that they'll, uh, they can survive. So that data surveys is one way to do that, and they weren't being done prior to last year. Um, so in order to get real numbers, then that's one of the ways to do it. Councilor Hamill. One thing I will say, uh, you know, I'm somewhat familiar with uh, the, with clamors, you know, uh, the shellfish crowd. So at best, I'm a lousy recreational digger. You know, I'm not I'm not very good at all. But I, one thing I do know is if if somehow Angela's recommendation were off base, we would hear about it. Okay. So there is a system in place. Uh, we would, yes. So I so to net this all, I'm quite comfortable with what Angela is recommending notwithstanding the fact that uh, we're kind of data-driven bunch here lately, so. Any more? No? Okay. All those in favor. Oh, yeah, I got it, thanks. <laughs> All those in favor? <laughs> <laughs> Item number nine is standing in special yeah. committee, re committee reports and liaison reports, and I'll start with Councilor Kluge. Uh, brief update, the, uh, uh, to my knowledge anyways, the uh, Community Center Committee completed that report, their report. Uh, we have not taken receipt of that report yet as a council. I expect that will happen at some point in the near future. Uh, and there is still pending the consultant's report that we expect towards the end of the month. Um, so that's all for committee updates. I'm just, can I take a moment just to add Please. on it, just for clarity? Um, I said this earlier amongst some of us, but just for some clarity, as the chair and vice chair, we were waiting for the consultant's report. We thought it would make the most sense to present these two to the public uh, together. However, with that said, the community center committee is done with their work and they would like us to see it. So we will be receiving it, my guess is, by the end of the week. And so we'll have access to it to read it and to start looking over it. Um, my intentions are to wait to the consulting report, but if anybody individually wants to come and suggest otherwise, I'm completely open to it. But that, that was the decision. So. But it's flexible. That there's... Sorry, Councilor Hayes. Yeah, um, I apologize in advance. I think a couple things tonight. One is the Finance Committee did meet our first um, Finance Committee meeting on 128. We did, and actually, what came out of our Town Council workshop was an interest in getting the quarterly statements distributed to the Town Council on a very regular basis. So I did distribute the statements that we did see. Um, what I'll read in, into the record would be just, and, and what is done is staff does a great job of kind of creating the, the financial numbers and aren't always real exciting to look at because there's a lot of them. So they do a executive summary for us. We have a short attention span. And they, they try to boil it down to a couple things. A couple things to report out where we are as of 1231, so six months into this, this 
fiscal year, if you will. Um, there are a couple things that, that do stand out. General assistance, um, we've already we've overspent the budget by about 100%. So in other words, we have spent the whole budget as we sit here now. We actually think that that will probably continue. That will probably lead to an unbudget, an unfavorable budget variance um, of probably in the order of magnitude of 30,000 or so. Um, to the other thing, legal expenditures are overspent at this point in time by about 150 percent. So legal bills are running a little bit higher than we thought. But the the issue that that I that we probably sh I, I just want to make everybody aware of the as we have done the reval and as we sat down with folks and looked at their evaluations and made some adjustments today, we've made adjustments of about six hundred ninety thousand dollars in reducing the original assessed values of the properties as it came through the reval. Um, that will create some budget pressures at year end, but more importantly as we sit here as we start the budget season, the bigger impact of that, that means that as we head into the budget season, we have about $46 million less of assessed value that will put some pressure on the mill rate as we calculate it. Usually we have about 1% organic growth. This represents about a 1% reduction from how we set the mill rate a year ago. So it's good for us to know that as we head into budget season, but that's going to create some, some challenges for us as we try to navigate to our goals of 3%. Um, so with that, I'll close that out. If anybody, in, oh, and Tom, I, Tom, maybe you could speak to it, but because of that, you shared with us that you are aware and you've asked staff, you've got a contour curtailment process in place on expenditures? Yeah, I issued a curtailment uh, mid-December yep. uh, yep. for a number of reasons that you mentioned, but uh, you know, to make sure we end this year properly and, and prepare for the future. Um, and, and with that, then the, the other thing I'll report on the school um, building committee, um, they have moved through their process. The Board of Education has voted to proceed at looking at a consolidated school. They have put out a request for qualifications for the architect. They have actually got some of those results back, and they're scoring them and looking at them at this point in time to try <laughs> to select a partner to go forward. And the last thing I'll update on the library wants everybody to know that they have created a new website for the expansion, and there's information there about where they are in the expansion process and some of the preliminary thoughts and designs. That website is at expansion.scarboroughlibrary.org. So anybody that's interested, there's a lot of information out there on the library expansion. Again, it's expansion.scarboroughlibrary.org. So I guess with that, um, those are my updates. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Gleistein. Uh, rules and policies will meet Tuesday morning at 8.30. And I reported this last time, um, there's a senior Valentine's Day dinner and show on February 12th. The deadline to um, register for that passed. It was Monday. But um, if you're still interested in it, please call um, Community Services at 730-4150 and see if they could still accommodate you for that. That is a 55 and older um, dinner. Thank you. Councilor Katarina. Um, historic preservation. They would like the public's help, especially the old timers in town, um, to let us know about various locales or corners. Like, for example, Libby Corner is down where Walmart is now, and some of those more obs there's more obscure ones too, because we want to do a sign project of perhaps putting a little bit of you know historical signage about town with that, so stay tuned to that. Uh, and then I went to Augusta for the Legislative Policy Committee meeting. That's always a marathon session. <clears throat> we run through over 100 bills. Um, the session is supposed to be an emergency session. Yeah, right. They have as many bills as they do in the so-called regular part of the session. But um, that being said, um, the committees in, in Augusta are moving really quickly through the, through the piles. I didn't see anything that was of a particular, you know, impact upon Scarborough per se. Um, I think I only have to go to, a, that was our only meeting, having to go to Augusta. We do, otherwise we do it through um, 
Survey Monkey um, for any issues that come up. But um, that's where we're at with that. Councilor Johnson. <laughs> Gee, thanks. <laughs> the, oh, thanks. Yeah, the communications committee we met this week. A couple items maybe of interest. We met with the IT department, we, so we met with the new IT director, fairly new IT director, about eight months, right, Tom? And our new uh, webmaster, they gave us an overview of the architecture of our current website tools, and it was more of an under, for an understanding from us to so we knew where to focus our frustration about the websites. <laughs> but actually, it, it was very informative, uh, very eager, new employees for uh, three IT people on the communication committee so we had a good dialogue I thought we had we had a certain level of understanding uh, there was some takeaways uh, by them not we didn't give them work Tom we just asked them <laughs> to look into a couple things uh, and they were uh, more than willing to I, I have they were going to look into our alert system can we set up an alert system for committee documents council related documents on the website directly to us possibly the uh, public also looking into some of the indexing on our search results because you know that's part of our frustration on that uh, and there was one more and I can't remember it do you remember it, uh, John or Betsy there were three takeaways there were minor they thought they were minor wasn't going to cause them any work but they could be big hits for us so I know, and it's late in the night, so we'll let it go at that. Once once we get the follow-up, we'll report back to it. Uh, Larissa is reaching out to SEDCO to help us come up with a little uh, design for a communication theme or campaign to get people engaged with the e-newsletter related to the charge from the council on the uh, doubling the subscription of the e-newsletter unless that's part of the cur curtailment that Tom just mentioned. <laughs> she did say there were two or $300 in the budget that <laughs> she could probably use, so we'll have to wait and see on that. Uh, we're going to reinstate, for lack of a better term, the council corner on the e-newsletter. Uh, I'm going to be doing our rollout on the first one, so hold on to your pants on that for next week. <laughs> but then we're going to really look to the council for support. We'd like to have it at a minimum every month, but we'd like to have some type of councilor corner information to share council related information to the public. So you'll be hearing from us, or at least me, I'll be tapping you on the shoulder, please. Uh, remember we have a communication committee is sponsoring the round table on WEX. Uh, staff is going to give a presentation of facts only. This is not to be a selling meeting. This is typical roundtable. People are invited. They're going to, we're going to share information just on the facts, and then we're going to take questions, comments from the public. All counselors are welcome to join. That's on the 13th at 6 p.m. Uh, I'll let it go to that. With that. Where is your roundtable? It's going to be right here, 6 p.m. on the 13th. Council Hamill. Thank you. Uh, a couple of updates for appointments and negotiations committee. We met on Monday. Uh, Liam Gallagher joined us uh, <coughs> for an update on upcoming labor contract negotiations. Apparently, we've got the firefighters coming up. Uh, so they're, they're having an, an initial um, Man management team meeting, I think, uh, in a week or so. So we'll look forward to, to tracking with them on their issues and uh, may or likely have an executive session in March to talk about uh, issues and objectives uh, with a focus on, you know, trying to get an idea of what sort of budget impact there might be, especially for the economic items. Um, the uh, other thing I wanted to update on is that we are going through a, a process of reviewing current committees and boards. Uh, ones that are required, ones that are on the books and active, and believe it or not, we have some on the books that are not active. So we're looking at some potential opportunities uh, uh, at possible consolidations, um, um, and you, you know, so that'll be something that we'll, we'll be spending some more time on. Uh, 
we will be coming back with uh, more details on the uh, charge for staffing ad hoc committees. And Peter and uh, Jean Marie are going to be working on uh, helping us to draft that. Uh, and we're going to wait until we get the report out from the ad hoc, the first ad hoc committee, or most recent one, the community center committee, to uh, capture those learnings and figure out what, what, what worked and what we might do going forward. So that's, that's essentially it. Uh, I'll use my time to for two things. One, um, there is a joint committee meet. There's a joint workshop between the town council and the board of education next Wednesday at six o'clock. It's at the high school. I strongly encourage everybody in the public to come see. It is at the high school. <laughs> it's the room across from the old cafeteria, which I the all-purpose room. Um, Anyways, the purpose of that is to, we're going to have a presentation first from their enrollment expert, second from Jay Chase, and our objectives are to agree on a common set of facts and language that we will use regarding growth and enrollment. Uh, we will also use the third hour to get an update on the Eight Corners portable financing and to discuss uh, some possibilities of a remedy or perhaps a, a half path forward for the turf and track field. And I'll save those remedies for later because I don't think they're 100% flushed out, so I don't want to necessarily insinuate one thing or the other. Uh, the second thing that dawned on me the other day is, um, you know, I think communication is something we're constantly trying to do, and I think that we dropped the ball a little bit on the ad hoc community center committee, and I think I'll own that in the sense where we spent so much effort building up January 22nd, <laughs> and then it never happened, right? So I think sometimes we need to learn that perhaps we should communicate that things aren't happening, right? Um, I don't think it's any harm, any foul, so to speak, but it just dawned on me that we had a pretty, we had a timeline laid out in that timeline. Um, the timeline got tossed aside for many reasons, uh, but I, I do think that ultimately we'll feel better about the product that we're getting with the way that we're doing it now, so, which I think will help our decision making. Yep, I'll write it. I volunteer to do the next one. Yep. Item 10, town manager's report. Yes, just a uh, quick update of the public safety building. Uh, three different areas. Work is uh, progressing quite nicely. Uh, the masonry work is the piece that's caught everyone's attention. It's the piece that you see. Uh, I noticed today that they actually reached the final peak. And so uh, the ends in sight may be assumed to be on the peak uh, in that regard. But everything uh, continues on schedule. Uh, final finishes are going in, flooring, final paints on the wall, so on and so forth. Uh, the sale of the existing building, uh, we have passed our due diligence period, meaning all the environmental uh, reviews and such have been have been gone through. That's a big milestone for us. That uh, many deals get tripped up in that phase. So I'm very pleased to report that. In the meantime, the property continues to be listed. Our broker. Uh, it's a common practice for her and apparently in the commercial uh, area of continuing to list properties um, in the event that, that the deal uh, falls apart, uh, you still have a presence out there in the marketplace. Uh, related to that, we have engaged with the neighborhood in terms of a zone line uh, adjustment. Um, council may recall that this, this property and a number of other abutting properties are actually bisected by um, a zone line, and that's obviously uh, problematic for anyone looking to redevelop that site. This is uh, something that we've known of um, for some time town-wide and have systematically kind of cleaned things up. Uh, and frankly, because we own the property, it wasn't harming anyone, we simply overlooked this one, and so it's kind of the final remnant. Uh, we do expect to re-engage with the neighbors uh, and, and are looking for another meeting on the 20th of this month. and we we'll have the um, developer at that meeting, and I think that will go a long way for people to understand who they are, what their plans are. Uh, they're still in the formative stages, but just putting a face to the name, I think will be hugely helpful. The last piece on that front I'll, I'll report, uh, in spite of our best efforts to resolve issues amicably at the building, uh, we are heading toward mediation and arbitration with the architect on some design defect issues. 
Um, we have a you know, great comfort and protection through our contract and are exercising our legal rights uh, to protect our, our interests. So again, the good news is the project uh, schedule has not changed uh, and the work is getting done, uh, but we'll be sorting through responsibility for payment um, for months to come, I suspect. But um, it's, it's an unfortunate turn, but it, it's a necessary position for us to take to protect our interests at this point. Uh, this may be a matter for an executive session in the, in the future, if, uh, should it go further. I still, the ever, ever the optimist, hope that uh, something can be resolved through mediation and arbitration. It doesn't require further action. The last point I'll raise, just from housekeeping, uh, we will be looking to do the audit presentation before your next regular meeting on the 19th. I've invited uh, your colleagues on the Board of Education. That is school vacation week, so I don't expect it will be a full complement of the board. Uh, but, but key staff and, and certainly several board members will be present. So we do that as a workshop uh, before the meeting. With that, Mr. Chair. Great. Uh, council member comments. I'll start with Mr. Hamill. Uh, I just want to um, applaud the efforts, the extra efforts that are being taken to uh, share information. Uh, I think we're getting some good response to that from the public. I think we've had some people uh, tell us uh, uns unsolicited comments that, that they do believe the current council is working hard to communicate uh, more effectively with the public. So uh, I just encourage us to continue those efforts. And you know, we have a number of things we've been doing, workshops and so forth. I think they're they're paying off. So uh, I think we should keep on that path. Councilor Johnson? I know we're all tired, but I'll tell you, sometimes at the end of the day, I'm sure we've all felt it, you feel beat up because we're involved in a lot of things and there's a lot of opinions out there and they're all welcome and all listened to, but it, sometimes at the end of the day you feel beat up. So to come here really and hear things like from Chief Moulton about really good things happening in this town and with the Project Grace, uh, Speaker, uh, speaker earlier, it, it just it kind of level sets everything because there's a lot of good things that go on this town. I want to want to thank everybody that's involved in that type of stuff. Councilor Caterina? Um, yes. Yeah, speaking of Project Grace again, I've been involved with Project Grace for a number of years, even before being on council, um, and I hope that. People drop by. You don't have to stay for the whole two hours, 10 to noon, at the fire station. Uh, the Saturday, but they have a, they actually have a drive-through. You drive through, leave a check, and drive off. So uh, <laughs> yeah, there you go. So uh, please come by. It's it is important. It makes a huge difference to many people in town. Just have a little bit extra help uh, with fuel costs because uh, fuel costs, they're expensive. I mean, they are expensive. And then the other thing is, I just want to thank everybody who's written to us regarding WEX. Um, I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from folks, small business people, um, just the general public who are pretty excited about the possibilities. Um, and yes, you know, I've heard some pe from some people too who they think we're giving away money, but uh, we're not, but that's another, that's next week. Uh, two weeks, I guess. I'll talk about that. <laughs> so anyway, thank you. Next week is the joint next workshop. Next week is the uh, school board. <laughs> yes, Councilor Gleisstein. Uh, yeah, I would just echo that we've heard from a lot of people about the fact that we Councilor Hayes? Yeah, I haven't seen other anybody say anything about Sounds like some problems. Thanks, everyone. So, yeah, I, uh, I'm assuming I can go now, right? Okay. 
Yes, it's counseling. I, I, I was actually impressed with the turnout tonight, too. Uh, uh, pretty strong show of support for uh, the WEX CEA. Um, you never know, because we get a lot of emails both ways, and I, uh, I was encouraged to see that there was a, a pretty deep understanding of the impact that this could have and a pretty good showing of support. Uh, pet project that I've been working on uh, kind of relates to, it's loosely related to WEX, but um, you, you may realize that uh, there's a lot of other communities that are similar to Scarborough and, and rel relatively affluent that receive a lot more school funding than we do. And I've been trying to get my arms around understanding that. And I, and I think there's some communities out there that have a strategy. And one of the strategies is to try to direct their growth towards a TIF district, because TIF districts shelter your funds from the state. And I, I can quote a couple of numbers, like Falmouth, for example. They get 25% of their funding from the state, second richest community in the state. 7.5% of their uh, total value is in a TIF district or TIF districts. Cumberland gets almost half of their uh, funding from the state. They're at 3.8%. Uh, oh, no, sorry, they're at 6.1% of their total equalized state values in TIF districts. Um, who else? We got RSU 5, which is Freeport. They're at almost 5%. Well, Scarborough's at 1.25% of, of our total values in TIF districts. So there's opportunity there. And I understand that we haven't targeted that because we're a minimum receiver today, but that doesn't mean that we're going to be a minimum receiver tomorrow. As our enrollment grows up and as our growth happens in TIF districts, there's real, I mean, this is real opportunity and, and significant dollars for us to understand anyways, uh, to try to leverage the amount of funding that we can get from the state. So that's been my pet project. And I'm not there yet, but it's been interesting to work on. Yeah, I think um, just to, since WEX is a little bit of a, a topic here, I. We've had a ton of emails. There's lots of people that are, that are concerned about the WEX deal, and I completely respect that. I do. I, I would like to say, I think, two things. One, the taxpayer is at every single one of our decisions, and we're going to disagree on it. Um, but none of us are up here saying, I want to do this to hurt the taxpayer. We're all acting, whatever we choose, to, to act in a way that that's the only people we serve. Uh, I would like to say, too, my interactions over email, all over the spectrum, I've been super happy with, I've gone back and forth with many residents, for, against, and in between, and I've had some really productive dialogue. I've reached out to some people, myself. I just want to compliment that, those interactions. I think it's been really refreshing um, that we've had those interactions, both in person, over email, and over the phone. And they've, they have felt honest, and they have felt like everybody's coming from an appropriate place and that makes me feel good when as Councillor Johnson pointed out there's days there's days there's few, there's very few days as a counselor where at the end of the day you're pretty beat up and we have about 30 of those days at least 14 of those days ahead of us <laughs> 14 of them have been behind us but I just wanted to say I, it's been nice to have these interactions and you know everybody's has the taxpayer at heart and if we can agree on that then we can disagree on where we end up so Okay. Ma'am, just one final comment. No, no, I'm the chair. No. <laughs> In the interest of being heard, I, I, have, I have heard from a, one of our very close followers and listeners that at least three of us were, uh, were not able to be heard very clearly tonight. I don't know whether that's, you're not close enough to the microphone, not a problem for me, uh, or your voice or whatever, yep. but I will speak to those individuals and make sure that we are being heard, yep. literally. So. With that, uh, motion to adjourn? So moved. <laughs> All those in favor? <laughs>